What's up guys, welcome to another Fazbear Fright read-through. Today we are going to be doing the second story of the first book, Into the Pit, which is To Be Beautiful, and this is one of my favourite stories. Obviously I've read it, I'm going back to these stories because I didn't do read-throughs of these ones before. Anyway, uh, if you guys enjoy, make sure that you give this a like and you subscribe to my channel because I'm going to have more audiobooks in the future for more uh, books that come out. <laughs> so, we're going to get straight into this. This one is a roller coaster, really, and I really love this one. Um, we're actually going to read it again and see if I love it as much as I did when I first read it. So, let's go. Let's get straight into it. I am very sorry for all of the highlighted areas. This is just the first time I've read it and I don't know how you get rid of them. <laughs> so I, I apologise. Anyway, let's begin. Flat and fat. Those were the two words that Sarah thought of when she looked in the mirror. Which she did a lot. How could somebody with such a curved belly be as flat as an ironing board somewhere else? I, I completely messed up that line. How could somebody with such a curved belly be as flat as an ironing board everywhere else? Other girls could describe their shapes as being like an hourglass or a pear. Sarah was shaped like a potato. Looking at her bulbous nose, her prominent ears, and how all her parts seemed stuck onto her body at random, she was reminded of the Mrs. Mixon match doll she had as a kid. The one with different eyes, ears, no noses, mouths, and other body parts you could stick on her to make her look as hilarious as you wanted. And so that was the nickname she came up with for herself, Mrs. Mixon match. But at least Mrs. Mix and Match had Mrs. Mr. Mix and Match. Unlike the girls at school whom she called the beautiful, Sarah didn't have a boyfriend or any prospect of one. Sure, there was one boy she looked at, dreamed of, but she knew he wasn't looking at or dreaming of her. She guessed that she, like Mr. Mrs. Mix and Match in her single days, would just have to sit and wait around until some equally unfortunate looking guy came along but in the meantime she needed to finish getting ready for school. Still looking at her worst enemy, the mirror, she applied some mascara and pink tinted lip balm. For her birthday, her mum had finally given her permission to wear a little light makeup. She gave her dull, uh, mousy, mousy brown hair <laughs> uh, a thorough brushing. A, uh, she sighed, it was a good, it was as good as it was going to get, and it wasn't good. The walls of Sarah's room were decorated with photos of models and pop stars she had cut out of magazines. Their eyes were smoky, their lips full, their legs long. They were slender, curvy and confident, young but womanly, and their perfect bodies were wearing clothes Sarah couldn't even dream of affording. Sometimes when she was getting ready in the morning, she felt as if these goddesses of beauty were looking at her with disappointment. Oh, they seemed to say, is that what you're wearing? Or, no hope of a modelling career for you, sweetheart. Still, she liked having the goddesses there. If she couldn't see beauty when she looked in the mirror, at least she could see it when she looked at the walls. In the kitchen, her mom was dressed for work in a long floral print dress, her salt and pepper hair long and loose down her back. Her mom never wore makeup or did anything special with her hair and she did have a tendency to put on weight around her hips. Still, Sarah had to admit that her mom had a natural prettiness she herself lacked. Maybe it skips a generation, Sarah thought. Hey, cupcake, mom said. I picked up some bagels. I got that kind you like with all the seeds. You want me to pop one in the toaster for you? No, I'll just have a yogurt, Sarah said, though her mouth watered at the thought of a toasty everything bagel slathered in cream cheese. I don't need all those carbs. Mom rolled her eyes. Sarah, those little yogurt cups you live on have ju uh, have just 90 calories in, them, calories in them. It's a wonder you don't pass out from hunger in school. She took a big bite of the bagel she had fixed for herself. She had put the top and bottom together sandwich style and cream cheese squished out when she chomped it. Besides, Mom said, her mouth full, you're much too young to be worried about carbs and you're much too old not to be worried about them, Sarah wanted to say, but she stopped herself. Instead, she said, A yoghurt and a bottle of water will be plenty to hold me over until lunchtime. Suit yourself, Mum said. 
but I'm telling you, this bagel is delicious. Unlike most mornings, Sarah actually made it to the school bus in time, so she didn't have to walk. She sat by herself and watched YouTube makeup tutorials on her phone. Maybe on her next birthday, mum would let her wear more than mascara and BB cream and tinted lip balm. She could get what she needed to do some real contouring, to make her cheekbones look more pronounced and her nose less bulbous. Getting her brows done professionally would also really help. Right now, she and her tweezers were fighting a daily battle against the unibrow. Before first period, as she got her science book out of her locker, she saw them. They strutted down the hall like supermodels doing a runaway show, and everybody, everybody, stopped what they were doing to watch them. Lydia, Gillian, Tabitha, and Emma. They were cheerleaders. They were royalty. They were stars. They were who every girl in the school wanted to be, and who every boy in the school wanted to be with. They were the beautifuls. Dun 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 dun! <laughs> no. Uh, each girl, I, I thought they deserved like a The Incredibles kind of thing. Sorry. Uh, each girl had her own particular brand of beauty. Lydia had blonde hair and blue eyes and a rosy complexion, while Julian had fiery red hair and cat like green eyes. I don't care. Tabitha was dark with chocolate brown eyes and lustrous brown hair and Emma had a chestnut hair and enormous doe-like brown eyes. All the girls had long hair, the better to flip luxuriously over your f their, f their shoulders and, <laughs> and were slender but with enough curves to fill out their clothes in the bust and the hips. And their clothes. Their clothes were as beautiful as they were. Uh, as they were, sorry. All bought at high-end stores in big cities they visited on their vacations. Today, they were all wearing black and white. A short black dress with a white collar and cuffs for Lydia. A white shirt with a black and white polka dot miniskirt for Gillian. Ah, oh, to be fair, that's the way to go. Uh, <laughs> a black and white striped... Wait, what are they? Penguins? A voice cut off Sarah's admiring thoughts. Huh? Sarah turned to see Abby, her best friend since kindergarten. Uh... I just said that completely wrong. I, I butcher every single word in this book. Uh, she was wearing some kind of hideous poncho and a long, loose, floral print skirt. She looked like she could be running a fortune telling booth at the school carnival. Why do I know what that looks like? I said they don't look like penguins, Abby said. Let's hope there, there aren't any hungry seals around. She made a loud, loud barking sound then laughed. You're crazy, Sarah said. I think they look perfect. You always do, Abby said. She was hugging her social studies book against her chest. And I have a theory about why. You have a theory about everything, Sarah said. It was true. Abby wanted to be a scientist, and all those theories would probably come in handy one day when she was working on her PhD. You know how we used to play Barbies when we were little? Abby asked. When they were little, Sarah and Abby had each had pink carrying cases filled with Barbies and their various clothes and accessories. They had taken turns carrying their cases to each other's houses and had played for hours, stopping only for juice box and graham cracker breaks. Life had been so easy back then. Yeah, Sarah said. It was funny. Abby hadn't changed much since those days. She still wore her hair in the same braids, still wore gold uh, wire-framed glasses. The braces on her teeth and a few inches of height were the only differences. Still, when Sarah looked at Abby, she could at least see that the opportunity for beauty was there. Abby had a flawless coffee with cream complexion and startling hazel eyes behind those glasses of hers. She took dance classes after school and had a graceful, slender body, even if she hid it under hideous ponchos and other baggy clothes. Sarah had no beauty and it tormented her. Abby had beauty, but didn't care about it enough to notice. My theory, Abby said, getting animated the way she did when she was lecturing, is that you used to love to play with Barbies, but now that you're too old for them, you just need a Barbie substitute. Those empty-headed fashionist stars are your Barbie substitute. That's why you wanted to play with them. Play? Sometimes it was like Abby was still a little kid. I don't want to play with them, Sarah said, though she wasn't sure this was exactly true. I'm too old to play with anybody, I just admire them, is all. Abby rolled her eyes. What is there to admire? The fact that they can match their eyeshadows to their outfits? If you'll excuse me, I think I'll go on admiring Marie Curie and Rosa Parks. Sarah smiled. Abby had always been such a nerd. A lovable nerd, but still a nerd. Relatable. <laughs>
Well, you've never had much interest in fashion. I remember how you used to treat your Barbies. Abby grinned back. Well, there was the one I shaved bald. And then there was the one with the hair I coloured green with a magic marker so it looked like some kind of crazy supervillain. She wiggled her eyebrows. Now if those teen queens would let me play with them that way, I might be interested. Sarah laughed. You're the one who's a supervillain. Nope, Abby said. Just a smart aleck. I don't know what that, that means. <laughs> Which is why I'm way more fun of those cheerleaders. Abby gave a little wave and then hurried off to class. At lunch, Sarah sat across from Abby. It was Friday, which was pizza day, and then on Abby's tray was one of the school's rectangular pizza slices, a cup of fruit cocktail, and a carton of milk. School pizza wasn't the best, but it was still pizza, so it was pretty good. Too many carbs, though. Sarah had hit the salad bar instead and had gotten a green salad with low-fat vinaigrette dressing. I don't eat salad, so I'd have no idea what that word is. <laughs> Vinaigrette? Vin Has that got like vinegar in it? <laughs> vinaigrette. Um, she liked ranch a lot better than vinaigrette, but <laughs> ranch added too many calories. The other kids at the table were nerds who hurried through their lunch so they could play card games until the bell rang. Sarah knew the beautifuls called it the loser table. Sarah stabbed at her lettuce with her dull plastic fork. What would you do? She asked Abby. If you had a million dollars... Abby grinned. Oh, that's easy. First, I'd wait, Sarah said, because she knew the kind of thing Abby was going to say. You're not allowed to say that you would give it to the Humane Society or the homeless or whatever. The money's just to spend on yourself. Abby smiled. And since it's imaginary money, I don't have to feel guilty. That's right, Sarah said, crunching on a baby carrot. Okay, Abby took a bite of pizza and chewed thoughtfully. Well, in that case, I'd use it to travel. Paris first, I think with my mum and dad and brother, we'd stay in a fancy hotel and go to the Eiffel Tower and the Louvre and eat the best restaurants. Eat the best restaurants? Yep, yeah, well done Ozone. Eat at the best restaurants and stuff ourselves with pastries and drink coffee at fancy cafes and people watch. What would you do? Sarah pushed her salad around on her plate. Well, I'd definitely get my teeth professionally whitened and I'd go to one of those high-end salons and get my hair cut and coloured. Blonde, but a realistic looking blonde. I'd get skin treatments and a makeover with really good makeup, not the cheap drugstore kind. And I'd get a nose job. There are other cosmetic procedures I'd like to have, but I don't think they'll do them on a kid. Not gonna lie, I think the uh, the, the teeth whitening is gonna cost you all of it. <laughs> um, I, I, I know for a fact that that is very expensive alone, like getting your teeth done. You'll know that someone's rich if they have really, really nice teeth. Anyway. And they shouldn't, Abby said. She looked shocked, like Sarah had said something really bad. Seriously, you'd put yourself through all that pain and suffering just to change the way you look? I had my tonsils taken out, and it was horrible. I'll never have any other operation if I can help it. She looked at Sarah intensely. What's wrong with your nose anyway? Sarah put her hand to her nose. Isn't it obvious? It's huge, Abby laughed. No, it's not. It's, it's just a regular nose, a nice nose. And when you think about it, does anybody really have a beautiful nose? Noses are kind of weird. I actually like animal noses better than people noses. My dog has a really cute nose. Sarah shot a glance over to the beautiful table. All of them had perfect tiny noses, adorable little buttons, not a single potato nose in the bunch. Abby looked over to the table where Sarah was looking. Oh, the penguins again? Oh, okay, so the thing about penguins is they may be cute, but they all look alike. You're a person, and you should look like an individual. Yeah, an ugly individual, Sarah said, pushing away her salad plate. No, a nice-looking individual who worries too much about her appearance. Abby reached out and touched Sarah's forearm. You've changed a lot in the past couple of years, Sarah. We used to talk about books and movies and music. Now you, all you want to talk about is how you don't like the way you look and, and about clothes and hairstyles and make makeup you wish you could afford. And instead of having pictures on your wall of cute baby animals like you used to, you've got pictures of all those skinny models. I liked the baby animals a lot better. Sarah felt anger rising like bile in her throat. How dare Abby judge her? Friends were supposed to be the people who didn't judge you. She stood up. You're right, Abby, she said, loud enough so that the other people at the table turned to look at her. I have changed. I've grown up, and you haven't. I think about adult things and you still buy stickers and watch cartoons and draw horses. Sarah was so angry that she marched off 
and left her tray on the table for somebody else to clean up. By the time school was over, Sarah had a plan. She wasn't going to sit at the loser table anymore because she wasn't going to be a loser. She was going to be as popular and as pretty as she could possibly be. It was amazing how quickly her plan fell into place. As soon as she was home, she drug in a... Sorry, I read that as drug. <laughs> she dug in her dresser drawer where she kept her money. She had $20 of birthday money from her grandma and 10 left from her allowance. It was enough. The beauty supply store was just about a 15 minute walk from her house. She could get there and back and do what she needed to do before her mum got home at six. The store was brightly lit, with row after row of beauty products, brushes and curling irons, hair dryers, na nail polish and makeup. She headed for their aisle labelled hair colour. She didn't have to have a million dollars to become a blonde. She could do it for around ten bucks and just look like a million. She selected a box marked Pure Platinum decorated with a picture of a smiling model with long, luminous, white gold hair. Beautiful. The woman at the checkout counter had obviously dyed bright red hair and false eyelashes that made her resemble a, gir a, a giraffe? A giraffe? Red hair and false eyelashes? Oh, I guess it's just the eyelashes. I was like, how does red hair... Oh, giraffes can have, like, brown, red... Uh, whatever. Shut up. Ow, I just slapped myself really hard. Now, if you want your hair to look like the picture, you'll have to bleach it first, she said. Bleach it? How? Sarah asked. Her mummy used bleach and water to clean the floor sometimes. Surely this wasn't the same thing. You want to get the peroxide that's back on aisle two, the cashier said. When Sarah returned with the plastic bottle, the woman looked at her with narrowed eyes. Does your mama know you're about to colour your hair, hon? Oh, sure, Sarah said, not making eye contact. She doesn't mind. She didn't know if her mum would mind or not. She guessed she would find out. Well, that's good then, she said, ringing up Sarah's purchases. Maybe she can help you. Make sure you get the colour on good and even. At home, Sarah locked herself in the bathroom and read the directions from the box of hair colour. They seemed simple enough. She put on the black plastic gloves that came with the hair dye kit, draped a towel around her shoulders and worked the peroxide into her hair. She wasn't sure how long to leave the peroxide on, and so she sat on the edge of the bathtub and played a few games on her phone and watched some YouTube makeup tutorials. First, her scalp started to itch. Then it started to burn. It burned as if someone had thrown a handful of lit matches into her hair. She quickly typed into her phone, how long to leave peroxide in the hair? The answer that appeared was no longer than 30 minutes. How long had she left it in? She jumped to her feet, grabbed the detachable shower head, turned the water on, cold, leaned her head over the tub and started spraying. The frigid water soothed her fiery scalp. When she looked in the bathroom mirror, her hair was stark white, like she had become an old woman way before her time. The bathroom stank of bleach, making her nose run and her eyes water. She cracked the window and opened the bottle of hair colour. It was time to complete her transformation. She looked up the hair colour ingredients in a squeeze bottle and squirted the mixture all over her hair and massaged it in. She set the alarm on her phone to go off in 25 minutes and settled in to wait. By the time her mum got home, Sarah was going to look like a whole new person. She played happily on her phone until the alarm buzzed, then rinsed off again with the detachable shower head. She didn't bother with the conditioner that came with the hair colour kit because she was too anxious to see the results. She toweled up her hair and stepped over to the mirror to see the new her. She screamed. She screamed so loud that the neighbour's dog started barking. Her hair was not the platinum blonde, but sewage green. She thought of Abby when they were little, colouring her Barbie's hair with a green magic marker. Now she was that Barbie. How? How, how could she do something to make herself pretty and end up even uglier than before? Why was life so unfair? She ran to her room flung herself onto her bed and cried. She must have cried herself into a miserable sleep because the next thing she knew, her mum was sitting on the edge of the bed saying, what happened here? Sarah looked up. She could see the shock in her mum's eyes. I, I was trying to colour my hair, Sarah sobbed. I wanted to be blonde, but I'm, I'm, you're green. I can see that, mum said. Well, I would say there would be consequences from you colouring your hair without my permission, but... I think you're already experiencing some of those. 
You're going to clear up the bathroom though, but for right now, we need to see what we can do to make you look less like a, a Martian. <laughs> she touched Sarah's hair. Oof! If <laughs> I love the addition of the oof there. If uh, it feels like straw. Listen, put on your shoes. The hair salon at the mall should still be open. Maybe they can fix this. Sarah put on her shoes and stuffed her moss-coloured tress, tresses, tre tresses under a baseball cap. When they got to the salon and Sarah yanked off the cap, the stylist gasped. Well, it's a good thing you called 911. This is definitely a hair emergency. Ha, good one. <laughs> An hour and a half later, Sarah was back to having brown hair, now a few inches shorter because the stylist had to cut off the damaged ends. Well, Mum said, once they were in the car on the way home. That was a big chunk of my paycheck. I probably should have just let you go to school with green hair. It would have served you right. Sarah returned to school, not in a blaze of platinum blonde glory, but as her usual mousy brown self. I'm saying mousy, I don't know if it's like, it's not moosey, because moose has two S's, I don't know. Still, when lunchtime rolled around, she resolved that even without blonde hair, she wasn't going to sit at the loser table. She served herself from the salad bar, then walked right past where Abby was sitting. She didn't need Abby to criticise her today. A knot formed in her stomach, stomach when she approached the beautiful's table. They must have decided today was jeans day because they were all wearing cute skinny jeans with fitted jewel-coloured tops and matching slip-on canvas shoes. Sarah sat down at the opposite end of the table, far enough away that she didn't seem to be intruding, but close enough that they could include her if, she wa if they wanted. She waited a few minutes, expecting one of them to tell her to go away, but nobody did. She was relieved and hopeful. But then she realised that none of them even seemed to see her. They just kept right on with their conversation like she was invincible. Invincible. <laughs> I'm so bad at reading. Uh, invisible. She did not say that. Oh, yes, she did. No. Yeah. And then what did he say? <clears throat> Sarah pushed her salad around on her plate and tried to follow the conversation, but she had no idea who they were talking about and she certainly wasn't going to ask them. Probably they wouldn't even hear her if she said any, if, the, if she said something. If they couldn't see her, they probably couldn't hear her either. She felt like a ghost. She picked up her tray and headed toward the trash can, desperate to get out of the cafeteria, despite to get out of the whole school, really. Despite? Desperate. Ah! Uh, but there were still 7th and 8th periods to suffer through boring social studies and stupid math. Uh, excuse me, math is great. Uh, lost in her suffering, she bumped right into a tall boy, dumping the remains of her salad on his crisp white shirt. She looked up into the ocean blue eyes of Mason Blair, the most perfect guy in school, the guy she always hoped might notice her. Hey, watch where you're going, he said, picking a cucumber slice off his expensive designer shirt. The, uh, the sauce-covered vegetable had left a perfectly oily circle in the middle of his chest. Sorry, she squeaked, then threw the rest of her salad. What Mason wasn't wearing into the trash and ran a half out of the cafeteria. What a nightmare. She had wanted Mason to uh, notice her, but not in this way. Not as the ugly, clumsy girl with fried, frizzy brown hair who gave a new meaning to the words tossed salad. Ha, <laughs> that's a good one. Uh, why did everything have to go so wrong for her? The beautifuls never did anything stupid or clumsy. Never humiliated... Humili humiliated themselves in front of a cute boy. Their beauty was like a suit of armour that protected them from life's pain and embarrassment. When the school day finally dragged to an end, Sarah decided to walk home instead of taking the bus. Given how her day had been, she didn't feel like she could take the risk of being with a group, uh, a big group of kids again. It would just be inviting disaster. She walked alone, telling herself she might as well get used to solitude. She was always going to be alone. She passed the brown cow at the ice cream stand where the beautifuls went with their boyfriends after school laughing as they sat together at picnic tables sharing milkshakes or sundaes. And of course the beautifuls could scarf all the ice cream they wanted and not gain an ounce. Life was so unfair. To get to her house, Sarah had to walk past the wrecking yard. It was an ugly expanse of dirt filled with the destroyed corpses of cars. There were smashed in pickup trucks squashed SUVs and vehicles that had been reduced to nothing more than rusted heaps of junk. 
She was sure that none of the beautifuls had to pass a place so hideous on their way home. Even though the junkyard was horrible, or maybe because it was so horrible, she couldn't help looking at it when she passed by. She was like a passing driver gawking at an accident on the side of the road. The car nearest the fence definitely fit into the heap of junk category. It was one of those big old sedans that only very elderly people still drove, the kind of car Sarah's mum called a land yacht. This yacht had seen better days. It had once been light blue, but now it was mostly rusty orange-brown. In some places the rust had eaten all the way through the metal and the car's body was so battered it looked like it had been attacked by an angry mob wielding baseball bats. Then she saw the arm. Ooh, the arm. The arm, you say. A thin, delicate arm was sticking out of the trunk of the car. Its little white hand with fingers outstretched as if waving hello or waving for help like someone who was drowning. Sarah burned with curiosity. What was the hand attached to? The gate was unlocked. Nobody seemed to be watching. After looking around to make sure no one was nearby, she stepped inside the wrecking yard. She approached the old sedan and touched the arm, then the hand. It was metal from the feel of it. She found the handle on the trunk and pulled it, but the lever wouldn't budge. The car was so dented and battered that the trunk wouldn't open and close properly anymore. Sarah thought of the story a teacher had read to her class once in elementary school about King Arthur pulling a sword from a stone when nobody else could. Could she pull this doll, or whatever it is, from this wrecked vehicle? She looked around until she found a strong flat piece of metal that could maybe work as a substitute crowbar. Sarah brazed her foot against the car's crumpled bumper, slid the metal inside the trunk door and pried upward. The first time she tried, it didn't give at all, but the second time, it flipped open and threw her off balance. She fell backward and landed on her butt in the dirt. She stood up to inspect the owner of the hand she had been sticking out of the trunk. Was it a discarded doll, outgrown by some little girl and tossed in the trash to end up in the dump? The thought made Sarah sad. Sarah pulled the doll from the trunk and stood it up on its feet. Though once she looked at it, she wasn't sure doll was the right word to describe it. It was a few inches taller than Sarah herself, and it was jointed so that its limbs and waists looked movable. Was it some kind of marionette? A robot? Whatever it was, it was beautiful. It had wide, green, longer-lashed eyes, pink Cupid's bow lips, and pink circles on its cheeks. Its face was painted like a clown's, but a pretty clown. Its red hair was pulled up into two twin pigtails on top of its head and its body was sleek and silver, with a long neck, a tiny waist, and a rounded bust and hips. Its legs and arms were long, slender, and elegant. It looked like a robotic version of the gorgeous supermodels whose pictures hung on the walls of Sarah's room. Where had it come from? And why would someone want to get rid of such a beautiful, perfect object? Well, if whoever was... if, Well, if whoever put this thing in the dump didn't want it, then Sarah did. She picked up the girl-shaped robot and found it surprisingly light. She carried it sideways, her arm around its delicate waist. At home in her room, Sarah set the girl robot down on the floor. It was a little tarnished and dusty, as if it had been in the trash heap for a while. Sarah went to the kitchen and got a rag and a bottle of cleaner that was supposed to be safe for metal surfaces. She sprayed and wiped the front of the robot inch by inch from head to toe. The shininess made it even more beautiful. As Sarah got behind the robot to clean the other side, she noticed an off, an on off switch at the small of its back. After she finished wiping it down, she turned the switch position to on. Nothing happened. Sarah turned away, slightly disappointed. The robot was still cool to have though, even if it didn't do anything. But then a rattling sound made Sarah turn back around. The robot was shaking all over, like it was either going to rev up or break down entirely. Then it went still. Sarah resigned herself once more to the idea that the robot wasn't going to do anything, until it did. The robot's waist pivoted, making its upper body move. It slowly raised its arms and then put them down. Its head turned to face Sarah, seeming to look at her with its big green eyes. Hello, friend, it said, in a slightly metallic sounding version of a young girl's voice. My name is Eleanor. Sarah knew the thing couldn't be talking to her personally, but it felt like it was. Hi, she whispered, 
feeling a little silly for entering into a conversation with an inanimate object. I'm Sarah. Nice to meet you, Sarah, the girl robot said. Whoa, how had it said her name back to her? It must have some pretty sophisticated built-in computer or something, Sarah thought. It was the kind of thing her brother might know about. He was in college, majoring in computer science. The robot took a few surprisingly smooth steps towards Sarah. Thank you for rescuing me and cleaning me up, Sarah, Eleanor the robot said. I feel as good as new. She gave a pretty, feminine twirl, her short skirt billowing. Sarah's mouth was hanging open. Was this thing capable of actual conversation, of actual thought? Um, you're welcome, she said. Now, Eleanor said, placing her cold, hard, hard little hand on Sarah's cheek. You tell me what I can do for you, Sarah. Sarah stared at the robot's blankly pretty face. What do you mean? You did something nice for me. Now I must do something nice for you. Eleanor cocked her head like an adorable puppy. What do you want, Sarah? I want to make your wishes come true. Um, nothing really, Sarah said. It wasn't the truth, but really, how could this robot make her wishes come true? Everybody wants something, Eleanor said, brushing Sarah's hair away from her face. What do you want, Sarah? Sarah took a deep breath. She looked at the images of models and actresses and pop stars on her walls. She might as well say it. Eleanor was a robot. She wouldn't judge her. I want... She whispered, feeling embarrassed. I want to be beautiful. Eleanor clapped her hands. To be beautiful! What a wonderful wish! But it is a large wish, Sarah, and I am petite. Give me 24 hours and I will have a plan to start making this wish come true. Okay, sure, Sarah said, but she didn't believe for one minute that this robot had the ability to transform her looks. She couldn't even quite believe that she was having a real conversation with it. When Sarah woke up the next morning, Eleanor was standing in the corner as still and lifeless as the other decorative objects in Sarah's room, no more alive than the stuffed Freddy Fazbear she'd had on her bed since she, since, she, eh, since she was six. Maybe the conversation with Eleanor had just been a particularly vivid dream. That afternoon when Sarah got home from school, Eleanor pivoted her waist, raised and lowered her arms, and moved smoothly over to Sarah. I made you something, Sarah, she said. Eleanor put her hands behind her back and produced a necklace. It was a chunky silver chain with a large cartoonish silver heart pendant dangling from it. It was unusual. Pretty. You made this for me, Sarah said. I did, Eleanor said. I want you to make me a promise. I want you to put this necklace on and never ever take it off. Do you promise you'll always keep it on? Always? I promise, Sarah said. Thank you for making it for me. It's beautiful. And you will be beautiful too, Eleanor said. Since your wish is so big, Sarah, I can only grant it a little at a time. But if you wear this necklace and keep it on, each morning when you wake up, you'll be a little more beautiful than the day before. Eleanor held out the necklace and Sarah took it. Okay, thanks. Sarah said, not believing Eleanor for a minute. But she put on the necklace anyway because it was pretty. It looks good on you, Eleanor said. Now for the necklace to work, you have to let me sing you to sleep. Oh no, I'm going to have to sing here. <laughs> like, now? Sarah asked. Eleanor nodded. It's, it's early though, mum isn't even home from work yet. For the necklace to work, you have to let me sing you to sleep, Eleanor repeated. Well, I guess I could take a little nap, Sarah said, not entirely sure that she wasn't already asleep and dreaming. Get into bed, Eleanor said, moving in her smooth stroll to the side of Sarah's bed. Even though she was a robot, everything about Eleanor was so feminine and lovely. Sarah pulled back the covers and got into bed. Eleanor sat at the edge of the bed and stroked Sarah's hair with her cold little hand. She sang, Go to sleep. Go to sleep, go to sleep, my sweet Sarah. <laughs> when you wake, when you wake, 
All your dreams will come true. There you go. That was my rendition of Eleanor's song. <laughs> oh, God. Before Eleanor sang the last note, Sarah was asleep. Sarah was usually groggy and grumpy in the morning, but this morning she woke up feeling great. Eleanor, she noticed, was standing still in the corner of the room in her inanimate object pose. Somehow Eleanor being there made Sarah feel safe, as if Eleanor was standing guard. Maybe Eleanor was just an inanimate object, Sarah thought as she sat up in bed. But then she reached up and felt the silver heart pendant hanging just below her throat. If the necklace was real, the talk she had with Eleanor must be real too. As she moved her hand away from the necklace, she noticed something else. Her arm, both her arms actually. They were slimmer and more toned somehow. And their skin, which was usually shallow, or sorry, sallow, was healthy and glowing. The dry patches of skin she was prone to have disappeared. And both arms were smooth and, uh, and soft to the touch. Even her usually chapped elbows were as soft as kittens' noses. And her fingers, as she touched her arms with them, they felt different too. She stretched out her hands to inspect them. Her once stubby fingers were long, elegant and tapered. Her formerly short, nubby nails were now longer than her fingertips and shaped in perfect ovals. Amazingly, they were also painted a gorgeous, soft pink, each nail like a perfect rose petal. Sarah ran to the mirror to give herself a full inspection. Same mix and match face, nose and body, but now with a perfect pair of arms and hands. She thought of Eleanor's words from last night. Each morning you'll wake up. Uh, each morning you wake up, you'll be a little more beautiful than the day before. Sarah was definitely a little more beautiful. Was this the way it was going to work? That every morning, a different part of her would be transformed? She darted to the corner where Eleanor was standing. I love my new arms and hands. Thank you, she said to the unmoving robot. So like, am, am, am I going to wake up every morning to one new part until I'm totally transformed? Eleanor didn't move. Her face kept the same painted on expression. Well, maybe I'll just have to wait and see, huh? Sarah said. Thanks again. She stood on tiptoe, kissed the robot on its cold, hard cheek, and then hurried to the kitchen for breakfast. Her mom was sitting at the table with a cup of coffee and half a grapefruit. Wow, I didn't even have to yell at you to get out of bed this morning, mom said. What's going on? Sarah shrugged. I don't know, I just woke up feeling good. I slept well, I guess. She poured some cornflakes in a bowl and drenched them with milk. Well, you were already passed out when I got home. I thought about waking you for dinner, but you were out like a light, Mum said. She watched as Sarah shoveled in cereal. And you're eating real food too. Would you like the other half of this grapefruit? Sure, thanks, Sarah said. As she reached for the grapefruit, her mum grabbed her hand. Hey, when did you let your nails grow out? This is This reminds me of like, um... The Big Bad Wolf from um, Red Riding Hood. <laughs> it's like, Gra Granny, your ears are so big. Granny, your your nose is, is very long. <laughs> like, it's not Granny, it's a Big Bad Wolf. Sarah knew she couldn't say last night, so she said, over the past couple of weeks, I guess. Well, they look fantastic, Mum said, giving her hand a squeeze before she let it go. Healthy too. Have you been taking those vitamins I brought you? Sarah hadn't been, but said yes anyway. Good, her mum said, smiling. It's definitely paying off. After breakfast, Sarah selected a pink shirt that complemented her nail colour and took some extra time with her hair and makeup. At school, she felt a little less invisible. While she was in the restroom washing her hands, Gillian, one of the beautifuls, came in. She checked her perfect face and hair in the mirror, then glanced down at Sarah's hands. Ooh, I love that polish, she said. Sarah was, so, <laughs> Sarah was so shocked she could barely manage to say thanks. Gillian flounced out of the restroom, no doubt to join her popular friends. But she had seen Sarah. She had noticed Sarah. And she had liked at least one thing about her. Sarah smiled to herself for the rest of the day. Eleanor was mostly nocturnal. When the last of the winter daylight started to fade, she pivoted her waist, moved her arms up and down, and sprang to life. Hello, Sarah, she said in her tiny, or sorry, tinny, little voice. 
Are you a little more beautiful today than you were yesterday, just like I promised? Yes, Sarah said. She couldn't remember ever feeling so grateful. Thank you. Eleanor nodded her head. Good. And are you a little happier today than you were yesterday? I am, said Sarah. Eleanor clapped her little hands. Good, that's what I want, to grant your wishes and make you happy. Sarah still couldn't quite believe this was all happening. It's really nice of you. But why? I told you why. You saved me, Sarah. You pulled me out of the trash heap, cleaned me up, and brought me back to life. And so now I want to grant you wishes, just like a fairy godmother. Would you like that? Her voice, white metallic, also, oh sorry, while metallic, also sounded kind. Yeah, Sarah said. Who wouldn't like a fairy godmother? Good, Eleanor said. Then never ever take off that necklace and let me sing you to sleep. When you wake up, you'll be a little more beautiful than you are today. Sarah hesitated. She knew her mom had thought it was weird when she came home yesterday evening and found Sarah already asleep. If Sarah fell asleep early every night, her mom would worry that she was sick or something. Plus, there was the homework issue. If she stopped doing her homework, that too would arouse suspicion, both at home and at school. I'll let you sing me to sleep, Sarah said. But could it be in a few hours? I need to eat dinner with my mom and then do my homework. If you must. Eleanor said, sounding a little disappointed. But it is necessary that you let me put you to sleep as early as possible. It's important that you get your beauty rest. After a spaghetti dinner and an hour and a half of math and English, Sarah took a quick shower, brushed her teeth, and put on her nightgown. Then she approached Eleanor, who was standing still in her corner. I'm ready, Sarah said. Then get in bed like a good girl, Eleanor said. Sarah climbed under the covers, and Eleanor came to the bed with her rolling gait. She sat on the edge of the bed and reached out to touch Sarah's heart-shaped pendant. Remember to keep it on, and never ever take it off, Eleanor said. I'll remember, Sarah said. Eleanor, sh uh, uh, Eleanor stroked sh Sarah's hair. I'm finding it hard to pronounce these S's when they, when they create like sibilants and stuff. Eleanor stroked Sarah's hair with her cold little hand and sang her lullaby. Go to sleep, go to sleep, go to sleep, my sweet Sarah. When you wake, when you wake, all your dreams will come true. There you go. That was the perfect version. <laughs> that was uh, optimised. Remastered, if you will. Remastered. Once again, Sarah fell asleep before she knew what hit her. She woke feeling refreshed, and when she stood up, she seemed to stand a little straighter, a little prouder, a little taller. She ran to the mirror and pulled up her nightgown to expose her legs. They were magnificent. She was no longer stubby Mrs. Mixon match with legless feet stuck onto her dumpy body. I don't think being taller in a... Um, I mean, obviously, it's personal preference, but I, I think um, shorter shorter girls are, yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know how to finish that sentence. <laughs> I don't know what... Uh, I, I think... I don't know. I, I don't think the fact that she's taller is like a better thing, you know, what I'm talking about. Um, I didn't mean it in any weird way. I, I'm, I need to continue and just completely forget. Everybody just forget what I was talking about. <laughs> um, her legs were long and shapely, with toned calves and dainty ankles and model's legs. When she ran her hands over them, the skin was smooth and sleek. She looked down and noticed that the nails on her perfect adorable toes were polished the same rosy pink as her fingernails. Sarah usually wore jeans to school, the better to cover her stubby limbs, but today she was going to wear a dress. She ran to her closet and took out a lovely lavender dress her mum had bought her last spring. She hadn't liked the way it looked on her then, but now it showed off her long, shapely arms and legs. She slipped on some ballet flats and admired her reflection in the mirror. She still didn't look exactly how she wanted to, that potato nose had to go for one thing, but she was definitely making progress. She put on the little bit of makeup she was allowed to wear, brushed her hair, and went down to breakfast. 
Her mum was standing at the stove, stirring eggs in a pan. Look at you! You're a knockout! Mum looked her up and down, smiling. Is it picture day or something? No, Sarah said, sitting down at the table and pouring herself a glass of orange juice. I just felt like making an effort today. Is there somebody special you're making an effort for? I don't know what that was. <laughs> I was trying to do well, chick, well, well, but I just completely forgot about the chip bit. Uh, Mom asked in a teasing tone. Sarah's mind wandered for a moment to Mason Blair, but then the image turned into her bumping into him and covering him with salad. No, you just just for me, I guess. Mom smiled. Wow, that's really nice to hear. Hey, do you want some eggs? Sarah felt a sudden ravenous hunger. Sure, she said. Her mum dished up scrambled eggs and toast for each of them and then sat down. I don't know what it is, mum said. But for, the, for the past couple of days, you've just seemed so much more mature and easy to talk to. She sipped her coffee and looked thoughtful. Maybe you've just been going through an awkward stage for the last year and so and you're starting to outgrow it, Sarah smiled. Yeah, I think that might be it. The awkward stage was my entire life before I met Eleanor, Sarah thought. Wow, her mind is really set on this Eleanor magic. Um, at school, Sarah saw Abby in the hall and felt a pang of missing her. The two of them had so much history together, going back to the days of finger paint and Play-Doh, but Abby was stubborn. If Sarah waited for Abby to apologise to her, it might never happen. She walked up to Abby and at her locker. Hey, Sarah said. Hey. Abby dug around in her locker and didn't make eye contact with her. Listen, Sarah said. I'm sorry I said those mean things to you the other day. Abby finally looked at her. Hey, they weren't wrong. I do still like cartoons and stickers and horses. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with that. Stickers and horses and cartoons are nice. And you're nice. And I'm sorry. Friends? She held her hand out, and Abby laughed and hugged her instead. When Abby pulled away from the hug, she looked Sarah up and down. Hey, have you gotten taller or something? There was no way she could explain it. No, I'm just working on having better posture. Well, you're definitely succeeding. Eleanor had put Sarah to sleep with her usual sweet song the night before. This morning, still lying in bed, she looked at her body to see if she could tell which parts had gotten an upgrade. To her surprise, the parts of her that had been soft and flabby were now tight and toned, and parts that had been flat and childish were now rounded and feminine. Sarah chose a fitted t-shirt and a denim miniskirt to wear to school. Her pitiful, little, uh, her pitiful little training bra wouldn't hook anymore, so she made do with the sports bra she wore for gym class. It was a tight fit. At breakfast, she asked her mum, Can we maybe go shopping this weekend? Well, I get paid on Friday, so a little shopping wouldn't be out of the question, mum said, pouring herself more coffee. Anything in particular you're looking for? Sarah looked down at her chest, then grinned sheepishly. Oh, her mum said, sounding startled. Well, those certainly snuck up on me. Of course we can buy you some bras that fit. She smiled and shook her head. Can't believe how fast you're growing up. Neither can I. It was true. Feels like it happens overnight, mum said. <laughs> because it does, Sarah thought. Wow, they had to sneak that little joke in there. <laughs> at school Sarah could feel eyes on her boys' eyes for the first time she felt noticed she felt seen, it was dizzying, exciting in the hall on the way to English a trio of boys, cute boys looked at her then looked at one another and whispered something then laughed but it wasn't a mean or mocking laugh wondering what they'd said Sarah looked back at them and bumped right into no it couldn't be not again, Mason Blair she felt the face flushing and braced herself for him to tell her to watch where she was going, again. But instead he smiled. He had a really great, he, sorry, he had really great teeth, straight and white. We have to stop bumping into each other like this, he said. Actually, I think it's me bumping into you, Sarah said. At least I wasn't carrying a salad this time. Yeah. His smile was dazzling. That was really funny. Yeah, Sarah said. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't know why I did that voice, but I'm sticking with it. Sarah said, though it struck her as strange that he said that the salad incident was funny now. When it had happened, it seemed annoying. Um, 
Well, if you're gonna keep running into me, I need to at least know your name. I can't just keep calling you Salad Girl. I'm Sarah, but you can call me Salad Girl if you want. Nice to really meet you, Sarah. I'm Mason. I know, she could have kicked herself so much for playing it cool. Okay, well, I'll see you around, Sarah the Salad Girl. He gave her one last flash of a smile. See you, Sarah said. She continued on her way to English, but all she could think about was that she just had a conversation, a real human conversation with Mason Blair. Sarah sat down next to Abby in class. Mason Blair just talked to me, Sarah whispered. Like, like, talked to me, talked to me. I'm not surprised, Abby whispered back. There's something about you lately. What do you mean? Abby crinkled her forehead the way she did when she was thinking hard. I don't know. I can't exactly put it into words. It's like you're glowing from the inside out. Sarah smiled. Yeah, that is what it's like. But really, it was the changes on the outside that were making her glow inside. In the evening, after Eleanor did her wake-up movement, Sarah threw her arms around her. It felt strange to hug something so hard and cold, and when Eleanor's arms encircled Sarah, she felt a flicker of what could have been fear but she quickly pushed the feeling away. There was nothing to be afraid of. Eleanor was her friend. Eleanor, Sarah said, drawing back from the hug. I couldn't be happier with my new body. It's perfect. Thank you so much. I'm glad, Eleanor said, clo uh, cocking her head. All I want is for you to be happy, Sarah. Well, I'm loads happier than I was before I found you, Sarah said. Today, it was like I could feel all these people seeing me, and they liked what they saw. This guy I've had a crush on for months even noticed me and talked to me. That's wonderful, Eleanor said. I'm glad I've been able to make your wishes come true, Sarah. A dark cloud suddenly passed over the brightness of Sarah's mood. Well, she said, not all of them. Wait, is this, who's, who's talking here? Uh, oh yeah. Well, she said, not all of them. She reached up and touched her potatoey nose. Really? Eleanor sounded surprised. What is it that you still wish, Sarah? Sarah took a deep breath. I love my new body, she said. I really do, but I'm kind of what some guys call pretty from afar, but far from pretty. Eleanor cocked her head again. Pretty from afar? I don't understand, Sarah. Well, you know, guys will say, she looks great from far away, but <laughs> don't get too close to her face. Oh, far from pretty, Eleanor said. I understand now. She laughed, a metallic tinkling. It is very amusing. It's not if someone's using it to describe you, Sarah said. I suppose it isn't, Eleanor said. She reached up and touched Sarah's cheek. Sarah, do you really want me to change all of this? Do you want a new face? I do, Sarah said. I want a, a tiny nose and full lips and high cheekbones. I want long dark eyelashes and nice eyebrows. I don't want to look like Mrs. Mixon Match anymore. Eleanor laughed her tinkly little laugh again. I can do this for you, Sarah. But you have to understand it's a big change. You can look in the mirror and see longer legs or a curvier figure. And they just look like you've grown. Faster than expected, maybe, but still, growth is normal for a child. It is something you know will happen. All your life, though, you've looked in the mirror. You've seen your face and said, that's me. It is true that your face changes some as you grow, but it is still recognisable as you. To see a totally different face as your reflection can be quite a shock. It's a shock I want, Sarah said. I hate my face the way it is. Very well, Sarah, Eleanor said, looking into her eyes. As long as you're sure. <laughs> uh, after Sarah ate dinner with her mom and did her homework, she showered and got ready for Eleanor to put her to sleep one more time. But as she snuggled under the covers, a disturbing thought occurred to her. Eleanor? Yes, Sarah. She was already standing beside Sarah's bed. What will my mum think if I sit down to eat breakfast in the morning and I have a totally different face? Eleanor sat down on the bed. It is a good question, Sarah. But she won't notice. Not really. She may think you look especially rested or well. 
but she won't notice that your plain face has been replaced by a beautiful one. Mothers always think their children are beautiful. So when your mother looks at you, she has always seen great beauty. Oh, okay, Sarah said, feeling relaxed again. No wonder her mother didn't re understand her problems. She thought her daughter was already beautiful. I'm ready then. Eleanor touched Sarah's heart pendant. And do you remember? Nah, hang on, hang on. I'll read that again, but... Surely, <laughs> the logic in uh, in Sarah's brain right now is kind of all over the place. Like, oh, my mother saw that I that I never had a problem in the first place because I've always been beautiful. Anyway, I'm gonna change my face. <laughs> it's like that's that's not the lesson you should be taking from that. It it should be that that your mother's always known you're beautiful because you've always been beautiful. Um. So yeah, that that's kind of <laughs> please. I can't believe Sarah's like, yeah, I can't believe, it's like Sarah's messed up here. <laughs> um, you remember that I always have to wear it and never take it off. Yes, I remember. Good. Eleanor stroked Sarah's hair and sang one more time, for God's sake. Do I have to do this again? Go to sleep, go to sleep. Go to sleep, my sweet Sarah. Yeah, I'm not doing the rest of that. <laughs> Just like before, Sarah felt the changes before she saw them. As soon as she woke, she reached up and touched her nose. Oh, there's the highlight. <laughs> she felt not a potato-like bulb, but a pert little point. She ran her hands over the sides of her face and felt clearly defined cheekbones. She touched her lips and found them plumper than before. She hopped out of bed to take a look. It was amazing. The person looking back at Sarah was a totally different person than before. Eleanor was right. It was shocking. But it was a good kind of shock. Everything she had hated about her appearance was gone and had been replaced by absolute perfection. Her eyes were wide and a deeper blue and fringed with the long, sooty lashes. Her eyebrows were delicate arches. Her nose was tiny and perfectly straight and her lips were a pink cupid's bow. Her hair, while still brown, was fuller and shinier and fell into pretty soft waves. She looked herself up and down. She smiled at herself with her straight white teeth. Beautiful. She was the total package. She surveyed the clothes in her closet. None of them seemed worthy of her new beauty. Maybe when Mom took her shopping for bras, they could also pick out a few outfits. After a lot of deliberation, she finally chose a red dress she'd bought on a whim, but could never find the courage to wear. Now though, she deserved to be the centre of attention. School was a totally new experience. She could feel everybody's eyes on her, guys and girls alike. When she looked at the beautifuls, who also happened to be wearing red today, they looked back at her, not with dis disdain, but with interest. At lunch, she mouthed hi at Abby then walked straight to where the beautifuls were sitting. This time, she didn't sit right down oh, at their table, but made a show of casually wandering past it. Hey, new girl, Lydia called. You wanna sit with us? She wasn't remotely a new girl to the school, but she was a new girl in her looks. Sure, thanks, she said. She tried to sound casual, like it didn't make any difference to her whether she sat with them or with somebody else. But inside, she was so excited, she was turning cartwheels. All the beautifuls were eating salads just like she was. So, Lydia said, what's your name? Sarah. She had hoped... <laughs> Sarah. Sarah. She had hoped Sarah was a name they found acceptable. It wasn't too bad. It wasn't like Hilda or Bertha or something. I'm Lydia. Lydia tossed her lustrous blonde hair. She was so pretty. Pretty enough to be a model, she would fit right in with the pictures of the walls on Sarah's room. And this is Gillian, Tabitha, and Emma. They knew no introduction, of course, but Sarah said hi like she had never seen them before. So, Lydia said, who's your dress by? Sarah had watched enough fashion shows on TV to know Lydia was asking about the designer. It's from Saks Fifth Avenue, she said. It was true, the label of the dress did read Saks Fifth Avenue. However, Sarah and her mum had brought it at the local thrift store. Her mum was so excited when they found it. She loved thrifting. How often do you get to New York? Lydia asked. Once or twice a year, Sarah lied. She had been to New York once when she was 11. 
she and her mom had seen a Broadway show, ridden a ferry to the Statue of Liberty, and gone up in the Empire State Building. They had done no shopping in fancy stores. The only clothing Sarah had bought was an I Love New York t-shirt at a souvenir shop. A few washings had worn it as thin as tissue paper, but she still slept in it sometimes. So Sarah, Emma said, regarding her with doe-like brown eyes. What do your mum and dad do for a living? Sarah tried to not bristle risibly at the word dad. Mum's a social worker and dad... Before her dad had left Sarah and her mum, he had been a long-distance truck driver. Now, she wasn't even sure what he did or where he lived. He moved a lot, changed girlfriends a lot. He called her on Christmas and her birthday. He's... he's a lawyer. The beautifuls nodded their approval. One more question. This came from Gillian, the redhead with the cat-like green eyes. Do you have a boyfriend? Sarah felt her face heat up. Mm, no, not, not at the moment. Well, Gillian said, leaning forward, is there a boy you like? Sarah knew her face had to be as red as her dress. Yes, Gillian smiled. And his name is? Sarah looked around to make sure he wasn't nearby. Mason Blair, she half whispered. Oh, he's hot, Gillian said. Definitely hot, Lydia echoed. Hot, the other girls repeated like a chorus. So, Lydia said looking Sarah over. Don't follow us around like a puppy dog or anything, but if you want to sit with us at lunch, then sit. On Sunday afternoons, we go to the mall and try on clothes and makeup. Maybe get a froyo. I don't know what that is. <laughs> uh, it's... Ooh, the thingy's gone weird. It's lame, but it's something to do. This town's so boring. She yawned theatrically. So boring, Sarah agreed. But inside, she was buzzing with excitement. Lydia nodded. We'll hang out a little and see how things go. If it works out, maybe you can go for out maybe you can go out for cheerly the next year. Consider this a trial period. Sarah left the cafeteria smiling to herself. Abby caught up to her. It uh looked like you were having some kind of intense job interview back there, Abby said. She was wearing grey sweatpants with a bulky purple sweater that did nothing to show off her shape. Yeah, kind of. They invited me to hang out though, so I guess I passed the test. She couldn't stop herself from smiling. Abby raised an eyebrow. And those are the kinds of friends you want? The kind that make you pass the test? They're cool, Abby. They know all about fashion and makeup and guys. They're shallow, Sarah. They're as shallow as a rain puddle. No, I take that back. They're so shallow, they make a rain puddle look like the ocean. Sarah shook her head. She loved Abby. She really did. But why did she have to be so judgmental? But they rule the school. That's how it works. It's the beautiful people who get what they want. She looked at Abby's gorgeous brown complexion, at her striking hazel eyes. You could be beautiful too, Abby. You'd be the prettiest girl in the school if you lost the glasses and braids and bought some clothes that weren't so baggy. If I didn't wear my glasses, I'd be walking into walls, Abby said, with a little edge in her voice. And I like my braids and my baggy clothes, especially the sweater. It's cosy. She shrugged her shoulders. I guess I just like myself the way I am. Sorry if I'm not fancy or fashionable enough for you. I'm not like the cheerleaders or all those models and pop stars whose pictures you have plastered all over your room. But you know what? I'm a nice person. I don't judge people on how they look or how much money they have. And I don't have to give a person a pop quiz to decide if I'll let them hang out with me or not. Abby looked at Sarah's face searchingly. You have changed, Sarah. And not for the better. Abby turned her back on Sarah and marched down the hall. Sarah knew Abby was a little mad at her, but she also knew an apology and a hug would fix things once she'd had some time to cool down. After the bell walking towards the school bus, Sarah became suddenly aware of a presence beside her. Hey, a male voice said. She turned to see Mason Blair, looking perfect in a blue shirt that brought out the colour of his eyes. Oh, hi. So, Lydia said you guys were talking about me in the cafeteria today. Well, I, uh, uh Sarah fought the urge to run. Say, if you don't have anything else to do, do you want to go over to the brown cow and have a cone with me? 
<laughs> I'm sorry for these voices. <laughs> um, Sarah smiled. She could hardly believe her good luck today. I don't have anything else to do. The brown cow was basically a little concrete block shed that sold uh, soft serve ice cream and milkshakes. It was right across the street from school, but Sarah usually resisted the temptation of stopping there since she had always been worried about their weight, uh, about her weight. <laughs> Uh, she stood next to Mason at the counter where the same bored-seeming old lady always took orders. Chocolate, vanilla, or swirl? He asked her. Swirl, she said, making a move to open her purse. No, Mason said, putting up his hand. I got it. It's a cheap date. I can handle it. Thanks. He had said date. It was, it was a real date. Sarah's first. They sat across from each other at the picnic table. Mason attacked his cone with gusto. Is that how I pronounce that? Because <laughs> it's not, it's not. It's with gusto? Nah, with gusto. I'm going to say gusto, the character from Ratatouille. <laughs> Mason attacked his cone with gusto, but um, that's definitely not right. But Sarah took tiny licks. She didn't want to eat like a pig in front of Mason, and she was afraid of the ice cream dripping on her dress and making her look like a slob. Even with her self-consciousness, though, she had to admit, the cold, creamy treat was delicious. I haven't had ice cream in ages, she said. Why is that? Mason said. Watching your weight? Sarah nodded. No need to worry about that, Mason said. You look great, it's funny. You've been going to school, to the school a long time, right? I don't know how I only just noticed you. Sarah felt herself blushing. You noticed me when I ran into you with that salad, right? Mason looked at her with his dark-lashed ocean blue eyes. I didn't notice you then the way I should have. I clearly need to pay better attention. Me too, Sarah said, so I don't keep plowing into people with trays of salad. Mason laughed, showing those gorgeous white teeth. Sarah was amazed by how confident her new looks made her feel. She could eat ice cream with a cute guy and make jokes with him. The old Sarah would have been much too shy. Not that a cute guy would have asked the old Mrs. at Mix and Match Sarah out for ice cream in the first place. Once they'd finished their cones, Mason said, Hey, is your house pretty close? I could walk you back if you like. Sarah felt a twinge of anxiety. Mason's dad was a doctor and his mum was a successful real estate agent whose face was plastered on billboards. His family probably lived in a mansion on the fancy side of town. She wasn't ready for him to walk with her past the garbage dump to the plain little two-bedroom bungalow she said she shared with her living from paycheck to paycheck single mom. Uh, I actually have to run a couple of errands this afternoon. M maybe another time? Uh, sure, okay. Was it Sarah's imagination or did he look kind of disappointed? He looked down at his shoes, then back up at Sarah. Hey, maybe we could go out... For real, sometime. Pizza and a movie, maybe? Sarah was pretty sure her heart had just turned a backflip. I'd like that. His expression brightened. How about this Saturday night? If you're free, of course. Sarah fought the urge to laugh. Had there ever been a Saturday night when she wasn't free? Um. What? What? <laughs> uh. Okay, it looks like the formatting's gone weird here, so it might have skipped like a tiny bit, but you you can tell what's happening. Um, Sarah flopped down on the bed and propped herself up on a pillow. I hardly know where to start. The beautifuls let me sit at their table at lunch, and then they invited me to meet them at the mall on Sunday. Eleanor nodded. That is good news, Sarah. Sarah leaned forward and hugged the old Freddy Fazbear teddy bear on her bed. And then Mason Blair took me for ice cream after school and asked me to dinner and a movie on Saturday. That's very exciting. Eleanor stepped closer to Sarah, bent to the waist, and touched Sarah's cheek. Is he a handsome boy, Sarah? Sarah nodded. She couldn't stop smiling. Yes, <laughs> very. Are you happy, Sarah? Sarah laughed and repeated. Y yes, very. Have I given you everything you wished for? Sarah couldn't think of a single other wish. She was beautiful and perfect, and her life was beautiful and perfect to match. Yes, you have. Then I have everything I wished for, too, Eleanor said. But remember, even though all your wishes are granted, 
the necklace still has to stay on. You can never take it off, I remember, Sarah said. She was always tempted to ask Eleanor what would happen if she took it off, but part of her was afraid to know the answer. Making you happy makes me happy, Sarah, Eleanor said. Sarah felt tears welling in her newly beautiful blue eyes. She knew she'd never have a better friend than Eleanor. On Saturday, Sarah was a ball of nervous energy. From the moment she woke up, all she could do, or all she could think about was the date. At breakfast, she was too nervous to eat much, even though mum had made French toast, Sarah's favourite. You'll drive me to the pizza place and drop me at six, right? She said. Whoa! I just realised. The pizza place. <laughs> That's a name. Uh, it's not really a name because it's not a proper noun, but whatever. There's no capitals. Um, of course, mum said, flipping through the newspaper. And you'll just drop me, right? You won't walk in with me or anything? Mum smiled. I promise I will not endanger your relationship by letting your new beau ca catch a glimpse of my horrifying face. Sarah laughed. It's not that, mum. You're really pretty, actually. It's just that it looks kind of a little kiddish when your mum comes in with you, you know? I know, mum said, sipping her coffee. I was 14 too once, believe it or not. Did you ride your dinosaur when you went out on dates? Sarah asked. Sometimes, mum said. But usually I'd just invite the boy over to hang out in the family cave. She reached over and uh, tussled Sarah's hair. Don't be too much of a smart aleck, or I might decide I'm too old and decrepit to drive you tonight. Have you figured out what you're going to wear? At this question, Sarah let out a dramatic moan. Oh, I can't decide. I mean, it's just a pizza and a movie, so I don't want to dress like it's the most important event of my life, but at the same time, how I look is really important. So, wear jeans and a nice shirt. You're a beautiful girl, Sarah. You'll look great in whatever you choose. Thanks, Mum. She remembered what Eleanor had said about mothers always thinking their children were beautiful. She knew that her mum would have said the same thing to her, even before she got Eleanor's help. Oh no, here's the downfall. <laughs> um, oh yeah, see, it's, it's not the pizza plates, it's the pizza palazzo. When Sarah's mum pulled into the parking lot of the pizza palazzo, Sarah's stomach was so full of butterflies that she couldn't imagine there would be any room for pizza. She knew she looked nice though, so that was some comfort. Text me when the movie's over and I'll come get you, Mum said. She reached over and squeezed Sarah's hand. And have fun. I'll try, Sarah said. Until recently, the idea of going out with Mason Blair would have been as realistic as the idea of her going out with a major pop star. It had been a fantasy. Something she dreamed of but never imagined would come true. Why was she so nervous when this was something she'd wanted for so long? Maybe that's what was making her nervous, the fact that she wanted it so much. But then she walked through the doorway of the pizza palazzo and saw Mason waiting for her in front of the hostess's station and she immediately felt more at ease. He looked up and flashed his gorgeous smile. Hi, you look great, he said. Thanks. She did think the turquoise top she'd chosen went well with her eyes. You do too. He was dressed casually in a hoodie and a t-shirt for some video game, but... He would look great in anything. After they got settled at one of the red leather booths with matching checkered tablecloths, Mason picked up a menu and said, So what kind of pizza person are you? Thin crust? Thick crust? Any favourite toppings? I'm a flexible pizza person, Sarah said. Despite her earlier nervousness, she was actually starting to feel hungry. I, I pretty much like pizza in general, except for one thing. No pineapple on pizza, ever. Agreed, Mason said, laughing. Pineapple on pizza is an abomination. It should be illegal. I'm glad we agree on that, Sarah said. If we hadn't, I probably would have just had to walk out of here and abandon you. Uh, my opinion on this topic is invalid because I have never tried pineapple on pizza. I would be open to try it, but it doesn't sound great. <laughs> I've had worse, I think. Um, whoa. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. I completely lost track of uh, my thoughts. Uh, and I would have totally deserved it, Mason said. People who eat pineapple on pizza deserve to be alone. That's a bit far. Uh, they agreed on a thin crust pepperoni and mushroom pizza, and they chatted comfortably about their families and their hobbies as they ate. 
Mason had a lot of interest, since Sarah realised she probably didn't have enough of them. Before Eleanor, she had spent too much of her free time worrying about her appearance. Now that that problem was solved, she needed to branch out a little, listen to more music, read more books, maybe take up yoga or swimming. As a little kid, Sarah had loved swimming, but once she hit middle school, she was too self-conscious to let anybody see her in a swimsuit. By the time she and Mason walked next door to the movie theatre, Sarah felt like they were getting to know each other pretty well. He wasn't just cute, he was nice and funny too. And in the dark theatre when he reached over and took her hand in his, it was the most perfect moment of a perfect night. When she got back home and was putting on her nightgown, Eleanor quietly strolled up behind her and put her hand on her shoulder. Sarah was startled but quickly recovered. Hi, Eleanor, she said. Hello, Sarah. How is your date? she asked. Sarah felt a smile, spreading on her face just from thinking about it. It was great, she said. He's gorgeous, but I also really like him as a person, you know. He asked me if I wanted to go into the basketball game with him next week. I'm not interested in basketball, but I'm definitely interested in him, so I'll go. Eleanor laughed her, tiny, uh, her tinny giggle. So tonight, was it everything you'd hoped it would be? Sarah smiled at her robotic friend. It was even better. I'm happy you're happy, Eleanor said, then moved back to a spot in the corner. Good night, Sarah. In the morning, Sarah found her mum in the laundry room. Could you drive me to the mall to meet my friends this afternoon? She asked. Mum looked up from unloading the dryer and smiled. You're quite the social butterfly this weekend. What time are you supposed to meet them? She folded a towel and set it in the laundry basket. They just said in the afternoon, Sarah said. That's pretty vague, isn't it? Mum said, folding another towel. I don't know. The, the way they said it, it kind of felt like I should know what they meant. She was so shocked to be accepted, even on a trial period, by the beautifuls that she was afraid to ask questions. Your new friends expect you to be psychic? Mum said. You don't like my new friends, do you? Sarah said. I don't know your new friends, Sarah. I just know they were, they were girls who wouldn't give you the time of day before and now they're suddenly inviting you to hang out with them. It's kind of strange. I mean, what's changed? I've changed, Sarah thought. Just look at me. But she said, maybe they just finally decided I'm a likeable person. Yeah, but what took them so long? Mum said. You know what friend of yours I like? Abby. She's smart and she's kind and she's straightforward. You always know where to stand with a person like Abby. Sarah didn't want to tell her mum that she and Abby weren't speaking to each other currently. So instead, she said, two o'clock. How about you take me to the mall at two o'clock? Okay. Mum tossed a towel at her. There's a typo there. <laughs> Sorry, I... I... Mum tossed at towel at her. Uh, now help me fold. Once Sarah had got dropped at the mall, she realised that Lydia hadn't said anything about where to meet them either. The mall wasn't that large, but it was big enough to turn searching for them into a fairly difficult game of hide and seek. She could text Lydia, she supposed, but it kind of felt like in order to be, expect to be accepted by the group, she had to figure out the way they did... Sorry. The way they did things without making a nuisance of themselves. <coughs> Apologies. Um... If she was only accepted into the group on a trial period, she didn't want to make any missteps. One false move and she would be back to eating lunch at the loser table. That's a bit harsh. After a few moments of thought, she decided to head to Dillers, the mall's most expensive department store. The beautifuls definitely wouldn't be hanging out somewhere cheap. Her intuition was good. She found them at the front of the store in the cosmetic section, trying on lipsticks. Sarah, you made it. I forgot the voice. <laughs> Uh, Lydia said, giving her a crimson-lipped smile. As soon as Lydia smiled at her, the other girl smiled too. Hi, Sarah said, smiling back. She really had made it, hadn't she? And not just to the moon. She had good looks, a gorgeous nice boyfriend, and the friendship of the most beautiful girls in the school. She could never have predicted that her life would be this good. Oh, Sarah, you should try on this lipstick, Gillian said, holding out a golden tube. It's pink with sparkles. It would look perfect with your skin tone. Sarah took the tube, leaned over the makeup counter mirror and smoothed on the lipstick. It really was pretty on her. It matched the rosy nail polish that never seemed to fade from her fingers and toes. 
It looks like lipstick a wait. Who's saying this? <laughs> it looks like lipstick a princess would wear, she said, studying her reflection with pleasure. It really does, Tabitha said, opening up a tube in a different colour. Her Royal Highness, Princess Sarah. You should totally get it, Lydia said, looking at her approvingly. Sarah tried to subtly check the price on the lipstick, in, uh, on the lipstick packaging. Forty dollars. She hoped her shock didn't show. That was more than she'd paid for the outfit she was wearing. But then again, she probably couldn't buy lipstick in a thrift store. Uh, in a thrift store. I'll think about it, she said. Now oh, go on, treat yourself. I want to browse around a little more first, Sarah said. Since I just got here. She didn't want to admit the only money she had in her purse was enough to cover a frozen yogurt and a soda. The beautifuls, however, bought lipsticks and eyeshadows and blush and brow pencils, whipping out wads of cash or their parents' credit cards. After they finished at the makeup counter, they went to look at formal gowns, because, as Lydia put it, prom's just around the corner. Isn't it just for juniors and seniors? Sarah asked. It's for juniors and seniors and their dates, Lydia said. So if you want... So if you can find a junior or a senior to take you, then it's just around the corner, she nudged Sarah. Too bad Mason's not older. Yeah, Sarah said, but she didn't mean it. She liked Mason the age he was. Besides, she wasn't sure she was ready to date an older guy. The dresses really were beautiful. They were the color of jewels, amethyst, sapphire, ruby, emerald. Some were sparky, others were satin smoothy and, uh, smooth and shiny, and others were translucent with lace and tulle. They took turns trying on dresses and modelling them in front of the mirror and taking pictures of one another with their phones. After half an hour of watching them with the sour expression on her face, a sales lady came over and asked, Were you girls actually interested in buying anything or are you just playing dress up? They ditched the dresses and fled the formal wear department giggling. I don't think that sales lady liked us very much, Jillian said as they walked out of the store. Who cares, Lydia said, laughing. She doesn't get to judge me. She just works in a store. She makes minimum wage if she's lucky. I bet she can't even afford to buy the clothes she sells. Who asked? <laughs> really, who asked? They went to the food court and ate frozen yogurts and laughed about how naughty they'd been. I just realized I've been saying yogurts. A lot of you guys will be saying yogurt. <laughs> um... Americans. Um, do you girls intend to buy anything or are you just paying dress up? Lydia said over and over again, mimicking the sales lady. They all laughed and Sarah laughed right along with them, even though she thought they might have been a little hard on the sales lady who was just trying to do her job. Gillian and Emma had left the dresses they'd tried on in crumpled piles on the dressing room floor. Now the sales lady probably had to clean up after them. But who was she to criticise the beautifuls? It was an honour that they invited her out with them. It was glamorous and exciting, like she was a guest on a reality TV show. No matter what they said or did, she was happy just to be included. Yesterday, her date with Mason had been perfect and now she got to be out with the beautifuls. How could she ever express her gratitude to Eleanor? Nothing she could say would ever be enough. That night, when Eleanor sprang to life, Sarah jumped up and hugged the robot's hard little body. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you for a perfect weekend. You're welcome, Sarah. Eleanor hugged her back. And as always, the sensation was odd. There was no softness in her hug. It's the least I could do. You've given me so much. Sarah settled down happily to sleep, but her rest was disturbed by a strange dream. She was on a date with Mason sitting in the movie theatre. But when he reached over to hold her hand, it was not his hand, she grasped, but Eleanor's, tiny, white, metallic and cold, the same hand she had grabbed to pull the robot girl out of the car trunk. When she turned to look at Mason in the seat next to her, he had changed into Eleanor. Eleanor smiled, revealing a mouthful of sharp teeth. In the dream, Sarah screamed. She opened her eyes to find Eleanor standing over her bed, her head lowered, staring at her with her blank green eyes. Sarah gasped. Did I make a noise in my sleep? No, Sarah. Sarah looked at Eleanor, who was standing so close to her bed that she was touching it. Then what are you doing standing over my bed? Didn't you know Sarah? Eleanor said, 
reaching out to brush back Sarah's hair. I do this every night. I watch over you. I keep you safe. Maybe it was because of the dream, but for some reason Sarah didn't feel like letting Eleanor touch her. Safe from what? Sarah asked. Safe from danger. Any danger. I want to protect you, Sarah. Uh, okay, thanks, I guess. She appreciated Eleanor's concern, appreciated everything Eleanor had done for her, but still, it was creepy for someone to watch you when you didn't know you were being watched, even if they were doing so with the best of intentions. I can stand by the door if it makes you more comfortable, Sarah, Eleanor said. Yeah, that'd be great. Sarah was pretty sure she couldn't fall back asleep with Eleanor standing right over her like that. Eleanor strolled over to the door and stood guard there. Good night, Sarah. Sleep well. Good night, Eleanor. Sarah didn't sleep well. She didn't know what, but something was wrong. In the cafeteria, Sarah stood in line with the other beautifuls as they waited to empty their trays. Lydia had texted the night before saying they'd all be wearing skinny jeans today, so Sarah was wearing hers too. She'd brought the jeans and a few tops and a couple of pairs of cute shoes when her mum had taken her shopping the other week. They'd also brought a few bras that they that did her new figure justice. Can you believe what she's wearing? She dresses like a preschooler, Lydia said. Like a preschooler from the poor family, Tabitha added. With horror, Sarah realised the girl they were criticising was Abby, who was emptying her tray ahead of them. True, Abby was wearing pink overalls, so the preschooler comment wasn't too far off the mark, but it seemed mean to reduce somebody's whole value as a person to the clothes she wore. That's Abby, Sarah heard, uh, heard herself saying. She's really nice. She's been my friend since kindergarten. She almost found herself saying best friend, but she stopped herself in time. Yeah, Lydia said laughing, but you've bought new clothes since kindergarten and she hasn't. The beautifuls all laughed too. Sarah tried for a smile, but she couldn't quite manage it. When it was Sarah's turn to dump her tray, she stepped on something slippery near the trash can. Her new shoes were cute, but they didn't have much traction. The fool felt it like it took forever, but she was sure it was only a matter of seconds. Then she was flat on her back, right in front of the whole school. Sarah, that was hilarious, Lydia said. What a klutz! She was doubled over, laughing. All the beautifuls were laughing along with her, saying, Did you see her go down? And she hit the floor like a ton of bricks. And how embarrassing. Um, in Sarah's dazed state, she couldn't really tell which girl was saying what. Their voices sounded distant and distorted, almost as if Sarah was trying to hear them underwater. Sarah tried to pull herself up, but something strange was happening to her body. She heard weird clashing and clanging sounds and couldn't figure out where they were coming from. It didn't make any sense, but they felt like they were coming from inside of her. She was shaking and jerking, and she couldn't make her body move the way it usually did. Her body was no longer under her control. She was scared. Had she hurt herself badly? Should somebody call her mom? Call an ambulance? And why were her new friends not helping her? They were still laughing, still joking about how stupid she looked and how funny it was. Then the beautiful's laughter was replaced by screams. As if from a great distance, Sarah heard Lydia saying, What's happening to her? I don't understand. I don't know, one of the other girls said. Somebody needs to do something. And why were her new friends not helping her? They were still laughing, still joking about how stupid she looked and how funny it was. Then the beautiful's laughter was replaced by screams. As if from a great distance, Sarah heard Lydia saying, What's happening to her? I don't understand. I don't know, one of the other girls said. Somebody do needs to do something. Wait, have I already read this part? I've already read this part, <laughs> for God's sake. I don't know how I, I'm sorry, I didn't realise. Uh, I don't know, one of the other girls said. Somebody needs to do something. Get a teacher, quick, one, another one said. A terrible thought occurred to Sarah. She put her hand out to her throat. Um... The necklace Eleanor gave her, the necklace that was never ever to be taken off, was gone. She must have knocked it off during the fall. She turned her head and saw it on the floor just a little more than an arm's length away. She had to get it back. A hand reached down to help her. Sarah looked up to see that the hand belonged to Abby. 
She took it and allowed herself to be pulled up into an awkward standing position. When Sarah looked down at her body, she was the reason. Uh, she saw the reason for the girl's screams. Her body was changing. From the waist down, she was no longer a flesh and blood girl, but a jumbled... Hello? A jumbled... Ah! A jumbled collection of gears and bicycle spokes and hubcaps, rusted metal odds and ends, cast off, useless parts that belonged in a wrecking yard. She locked eyes with Abby and saw her friend's horror at what she was, at what she had become. I... I I've gotta go, Sarah said. Her voice sounded different, metallic and harsh. Abby held out the necklace. You dropped this, she said. Tears sparkled in her eyes. Thank you, Abby. You're a good friend, Sarah said. She didn't say anything to the beautifuls who had all backed away from her and were whispering among themselves. Sarah grabbed the pendant and ran as fast as her new shambling makeshift metal legs could carry her out of the cafeteria and out of the school. Home. She had to get home. Eleanor would know what to do, would, would know how to help her. Sarah was still changing, her torso was hardening, and when she ran she made squeaking noises like a door with hinges that needed oiling. She tried to fasten the necklace around her neck again, but her fingers had grown too stiff to manage the clasp. As she hurried down the sidewalk with a clattering, shambling gait, people stopped to stare at her. Drivers slowed down their cars to gawk. People didn't look sympathetic, or even just confused. They looked scared. He was a monster like something that had been created by a mad scientist in a lab. It was only a matter of time until villagers started chasing her with pitchforks and torches. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm thinking about <laughs> Minecraft villagers. <laughs> Just villagers coming down, oh, chasing them with pitchforks. That's great. Um, she felt like crying, but apparently the kind of thing she was becoming was incapable of producing tears. Maybe tears would just make her rust even worse. Her joints were getting stiffer and stiffer, and it was growing harder and harder to run. But she had to get home. Eleanor was the only one who could help her. Finally, after what seemed like hours, she reached her house. Somehow she managed to work the key in the door. She clinked and clanked through the living room and down the hall, calling, Eleanor! Eleanor! Her voice was a terrible, metallic scraping. Eleanor was not in her usual corner of Sarah's room. Sarah searched the closet, looked under the bed, opened the chest at the foot of the bed. No Eleanor. Sarah clomped through the house, searching her mum's room, the bathroom, the kitchen, all the time calling Eleanor's name with her new horrible voice. The garage was the only place she hadn't looked. She used the kitchen entrance, but doorknobs were getting difficult to manage. Finally, after a few desperate minutes of fiddling, she was in the darkened garage. Eleanor, she called again. Her jaw was stiff and it was getting harder and harder to form words. Eleanor's name came out as Eleanor. Maybe the robot girl was hiding from her on purpose. Maybe it was some kind of joke or game. She looked at the ceiling high storage cabinet against the back wall of the garage. It seemed like a good hiding place. With some difficulty, she grabbed the handle of the cabinet door and pulled. It was an avalanche. Clear plastic bags holding different objects with different weights and sizes toppled out of the cabinet and fell to the floor with a dull, sickening thud. Sarah looked at the floor. At first, her brain couldn't even process what she saw. One bag contained a human leg, another a human arm. They were not the body parts of an adult, and they didn't appear to be the result of an accident. Blood pooled in the bottoms of the bags, but the limbs had been severed neatly, as if in a surgical amputation. Another bag stuffed with, a bloody, with bloody snake-like entrails, and what appeared to be a liver slid from the cabinet shelf and landed on the floor with a wet splat. Why were there body parts in her garage? Sarah didn't fully understand until she saw the small bag that held a familiar-looking potato-shaped no nose. She screamed but the sound that came out of her was like the squealing of a car's brakes. Behind her came a metallic, tinkling laugh. Sarah's lower body was almost immobile, but she dragged herself around to face Eleanor. I made your wish come true, Sarah, the pretty robot said with another metallic giggle. And in return, Sarah noticed something she'd never seen on Eleanor before, a heart-shaped button just below Eleanor's throat that was a double of Sarah's heart-shaped pendant. Eleanor laughed again, then pushed the heart-shaped button. 
She jerked and shook, but she also visibly softened, her silver finish turning the pinkish shade of Caucasian skin. In a matter of moments, she was a dead ringer for Sarah, the old Sarah, the real Sarah. The Sarah who, looking back on it, hadn't been so bad looking after all. The Sarah who had spent way, way too much time worrying about her appearance. Abby had been right. She had been right about a, about a lot of things. Eleanor pulled on an old pair of Sarah's jeans, one of her sweaters and her tennis shoes. Well, you certainly made my wishes come true, Eleanor said, smiling with Sarah's old smile. She pushed the button that opened the garage door. Sunlight flooded the room and Eleanor Sarah gave a little wave then skipped out into the sunshine and down the sidewalk. Sarah's ears filled with a deafening clinking and clanking. She couldn't control her movements. Different rusted metal parts disconnected from her and fell clattering to the floor. She was falling apart, collapsing into an ugly trash heap. A hideous, useless collection of garbage to be thrown away and forgotten. In an old mirror propped up against the garage w in the garage wall, Oh my god, are you kidding me? Am I am I not allowed to finish? I think it be I think it's because it ends on a single page and I've got it in like a two page mood. Are you serious? I want to I want I want to <laughs> I want to see the page. Page 78. There we go. She saw herself. She was no longer a pretty girl, or a girl at all. She didn't resemble a human of any kind. She was nothing but a rusty, dirty pile of junk. She felt sad, then she felt scared, and then she felt nothing at all. I love this story. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know what else to say apart from that. This story is so good. Um, I think... I think it did take a while to set it up and obviously like the killer moment is right there where where she turns to scraps and and, and she realizes she was beautiful the uh, the entire time at the beginning uh, and she didn't need anything else because um, well you know it's it's the classic thing of um, be careful what you wish for you know you might wish to be more beautiful but that's not necessarily going to be a good thing um, because you are beautiful as you are. Uh, that's the moral of the story. Um, I really like this. I really like this. Uh, it sets up a lot, uh, and it, as like the second story in the Fast Five Frights, I know a lot of you aren't, but those of you who are reading, like, the Fast Five Frights for the first time, and this is the second story you've heard, this, like, this is a really good setup for what to expect later on in the series, because this is incredible this is one of the best stories i think in the series uh there's a lot of improvements i know i would make but like th this story just the the concept of it is fantastic um so i hope that you enjoyed these audiobooks i am very sorry that it took like five months to get this one done <laughs> um but um we we did it eventually and next time we are going to be doing count the ways uh, I'm on my way to finishing the entire Fazbear Fright series uh, of audiobooks. Uh, Felix the Shark is coming out in April. Um, and then once you've done that, then that'll be all of the, the Fazbear Frights, hopefully. So I, I think all of the audiobooks should be out, uh, I guess, by May. And then we can go to Tales from the Pizza Plex. Oh, my God. Anyway, yeah, thank you so much for watching uh, or listening. And uh, I will see you in the next audiobook. Goodbye.